Uh, good day, everybody. Uh, let's have a look at this animation here of a, a net made out of chain links and uh, balls interacting with the net. We're going to do a quick 15 to 20 minute tutorial on how this is done. It's not going to be step by step covering every single thing, but by the end of it, you should be able to make this yourself with a little bit of work on your part. Let's get into it. Uh, so this is what the actual layout looks like for the net. And really it's pretty simple. There's really only three elements to this net. Alright, there's the top ring here. And then there is the supporting links. Which are also used in the net. And then there's the actual links themselves, right? And one link is cloned uh, for the use of the whole net all right and all up in this thing there ends up being 685 penetrating links to form the net i will show you in a second but i used a 12-sided circle to use as a layout guide because you gotta manually position all these links they have to be lined up before you add them to tie flow and they got to be lined up not like super accurate but accurate enough that they don't explode when you turn them into a physics shape right so and this is just how i laid out mine you can see here the number of links in you know top row middle row bottom row the cross ones and then you can see what links i ended up putting going up and just one note, consider scale, right? So, for example, you know, if we had a five centimeter ball, then the links would be in the point something, right? Which would not be good. This would not be good, right? So, what I did was I kind of thought, well, let's make my link, you know, two to three centimeters in uh, width that way I'll have no problems whatsoever with you know handling collisions with the tolerances and all that and then upscale the rest based on my link size right so you know basically I just said okay I'm going to decide to use a two to three centimeter you know link width here and I'll make the whole net and then I'll just make the rest of the items to suit that way I'm not going to run into um, penetration detection limits you know because you imagine if you make a link that's only 0 0.01 centimeter well that's the whole link itself now it's got to detect penetrations and i think by default you know typho uses 0 0.0125 or something like that but anyway just consider scale like i wouldn't super upscale but at least upscale a little to make your elements a workable size all right well we already kind of covered how to make a link but i'm using two types of link in my net we're looking at a top view here and these are my guides for the top row mid row and bottom row i already kind of worked them out based on my link size there's a set of links and there's a set of joining links right this is scaled up so we can see it compared to this size right and we're going to be using compound by element in tie flow as the whole type so we need to go in like we showed before and break down the chain links into elements right and as i've shown in my previous video there this is how i broke down this link into elements that are going to work with penetrating holes because we're going to have, as you can see up here, we're going to have all these chain links penetrating each other, right? And there's only two choices, like I said before, either compound uh, voxels or compound by element. It's going to be a lot easier to control your animation using this compound by element. So that's this chain link. And for this one here, I did a similar thing. All right, so you can see how every two... I've 
detached them, then reattached them to make one uh, link that's broken up into all those elements. And that's roughly so that when you've got a um, shrink wrap hole, you know, it's only really just going to cut across here, which will be close enough that you can't see it in our animation, right? So that's the layout. Our goal is to make, you know, the links conform to this in height first so we can lay out the net. Then we'll drop them to their actual height and then we'll put the others in. This is how we'll end up laying out an actual net. If I turn on this uh, top row here, you can see how I laid it out to my um, spline guide, right? So the easiest way to kind of do that, if you notice everything is centered on uh, zero, zero, right? So the easiest way I've found to do something like this is the top rows all have 11 links, right? So we're going to grab this set of links that's going to be our cloning job, right? And we're going to group them. Doesn't matter what the name, whatever it's called, because it's just temporary. Then we're roughly going to get them um, where we need them. Let's just pick this one, for example, start here, right? Doesn't matter where we start. Now we rotate it to the angle. And on 12 sides of the circle, that's pretty easy. I think it's 30 degrees. But anyway, that's roughly our angle, right, that we need. Now, it's not lining up perfect with the old one, but that doesn't matter for the purposes of this exercise. You, you, you look at your spline guide here. See the spline guide I made there? And we'll roughly position it on the spline guide. That's, see there? That's roughly the same distance from each tip. Good enough that this thing will go in there after. So we have one set of links lined up, right? And we've got the pivot centered to the object right now. So we go in here, affect pivot only, and we're going to type, change it to be zero, zero. So we go down here and click zero, zero, right? And now our pivot point for this set of links is right in here, which is the middle of our circles. So now if we go and rotate, and I think it's 30 degrees, so I'm going to hold shift key down, but you can see where right there, and at the bottom it says 30 degrees. Now we're going to make an instance of that um, 11 times, right? Boomba. So there's our top row. So now we're going to do the same thing with this link here, right? We're going to go in and roughly move that into position. Now, at the moment, it's back where it was in the center, so I'm just going to say effect pivot only, center the object, turn this off, move this over, and then scroll in here, uh, rotate it, 90. Now we need to rotate it to fit in the two links, right? So we're going to rotate, and then we just play around till roughly... That's not going to do well, so we just a little bit more here, something like that. I think that's going to be the angle. And we position it. So we're definitely clearing both links, no problem. So now we've got the joiner link, the first one set up. Now we need to do the same thing. Move the pivot to the middle, right? So we go in here, effect pivot only. Click the move, put it on zero, zero. Turn that off. Now when we do our rotation, 30 degrees, we do 11 of them. And this is how, we now have our top row all joined up correctly. If we zoom in on any of these, you see they all clear, right? This is clearing, all these are clearing, right? Everything's clearing good there, right? So that's how we do the top row. The second row has two links less, so we repeat it, but in the second row, the third ring has two less links again, so you repeat the same thing for the three uh, uh, horizontal rows. And that'll give us 
uh, three sets of chains all on the same level and now we need to um, adjust them to the height. All right, so I've gone ahead and created all three rows, right? Uh, right now they're all lined up together. So you can manually go in there and, and create, you know, a, a set of selection sets so that you can now move them into their respective heights, right? And I mean, as far as this is concerned, it's pretty easy. I could go in here and use this uh, tool here, start to just draw. All right. And just select this bottom right here. Now I've got all those links, create a selection set up here that says bottom row. And then I could even just go ahead and move them onto their own layer. And that's what you would do for each one of these so that you can adjust the height of each row individually. So I'll come back when all that's done. Um, what we should have done at the beginning is mention texturing because you need to consider it. As soon as you've created your links, one link that is, and one ring and one top ring, and you know what you're going to color everything, every time you create an object, you should assign that material ID to the polygons. But anyway, here's the layout I used for my texturing in V-Ray. Uh, let me just go in and show you how to implement that onto the objects. So these are the three components to our net setup. Top ring here is just convert to poly. We select elements, just click all the elements, and that's the red, which is material ID 4. Scroll down here, it's already set to 4, but just go in here and set it to 4. And then close out of your edit poly, and now you've set the material ID. And for the small ring here, it's also 4. Go into element. Select all your elements, scroll down, set it to 4, exit out for your links that are the majority of the net, that's the white material which is number 1, go to element, select all the elements, go down and set your material to 1. And now we've set all our materials so that when we drag and drop our multi-subject material onto TieFlow, things are going to look right. Now as long as you made everything instances, you can change the material on one and it will affect all of them, right? So for example, if all the links are an instance of this one and we change the material here, the material update will apply to all of them. So just remember, consider all your materials at the beginning before you get too deep in. You don't want to have to be individually selecting, you know, one of 300 objects if they're not instances. All right, so here comes the tricky part. You play around a bit to get all these lined up, right? So I'm using nine for my horizontal drops and we're gonna have two horizontal drops. And I've already, um, I've already grouped this set here, right? But, so that'll give me a rough idea of what height I gotta go here. And you can see the layout after we created all our links, right? So we use our uh, selection sets that we made and middle row here. And we move them down to roughly what we think is going to be the right height compared to those links, right? And for now, we could even kind of get our uh, bottom links so that we can at least visualize how this is going to get laid out. And then this first set of upright links has to kind of fit between these two. So initially we're going to play around here and get this one in the right place. We don't want it up too high and we don't want it too low, but we probably want somewhere right like that. Now if we want, we can get tricky with the grouped thing here and we can uh, go in and affect the pivot point for the group and just kind of move it up to roughly there 
so that when we rotate it now, it'll rotate from that point and then we roughly get lined up with this bottom link here, right? And you can see now it's going to penetrate here, so we have to do a little bit of movement. We have to make sure it doesn't hit this link here and it's inside the orange one here, right? That's not bad. All right, so now we adjust our bottom row here, our middle row. And get them roughly lined up. And that's going to just be a bit too close. That's not bad. Ideally, this could be a little bit more angled, but it'll do for now, right? And we would do the same thing for the bottom row here. And then we would also do the same thing for the final row that's going to go straight up and down from, from here up, right? But once you have that and you're looking in your top view, now we want to move the pivot point to the center again, right? Like we did before. So effect pivot only and we're going to zero it so that we can rotate on this center spot right turn the pivot off now and now we're going to rotate 30 degrees in this instance all right hang on turn my snap on here and 30 degrees and we do 11 copies All right, and there's our 11 copies, right? So now we're on the way to making the net. Let me come back and haven't done all of it. All right, so I'm back. I've done all the layers and you can see here how it looks in all the viewports. So all that really remains now is to take these links here and transfer them up the top. That's what's going to be what attaches to our our top big ring right and in this instance you can see we would have to rotate so I would just take this and move it up to this top row here rotate it 90 degrees because that's the way the link is right and my pivot point is in the middle Rotate it 90. Uh, zoom in here just to make sure it's where we need it to be. Now that I've got it roughly, that's where it should be. And that's what we need for all of the links. So now I would just move the pivot back into the center again. Effect pivot only. Uh, move it to the center. Turn off that. Do the rotation 30 degrees 11 times and now we got everything that we need for the net portion to add to tie flow and we just need to create uh, the top link now this top row of links here are going to be mesh holes which means they're not going to be animated we don't have to worry about the hole because There'll be mesh objects and a mesh object. The hull is exactly the sh same shape as the uh, mesh. And for the top um, loop, the rink up there at the top, it's going to be a mesh hull as well. So as long as we've created all these links the correct way with compound holes and the smaller links, because everything below this top row is dynamic, penetrating objects, and that's where you need the good hull. But really, this is it as far as creating the net. Now, adding it into TieFlow and turning it into PhysX. If your alignment is good, you're not going to have an explosion and everything is awesome. But uh, let's move on on this quickie. All right, so this is my final flow here for, the, for this uh, uh, bouncing ball animation you saw at the beginning. Uh, the top loop here is for the top ring and then these little rings up top now both of those two 
here are mesh and mesh, right? Which means, A, you don't have to worry about the hole too much. You just select the physics shape with the mesh hole. And that'll mean that they'll stay suspended in position. And as long as our alignment are good on all the rest of these rings, they'll end up uh, suspending off uh, those links, right? Then we got the net, which you know, is essentially anything below those top rings, right? And the guided ramp I'll show you later, that's just to guide the balls because we don't have a person throwing them, the backboard, and then the four balls. But, but the core component here that we're talking about is this uh, physics net. And we'll actually go ahead and kind of uh, create them now but it's easier for me to show you this final uh, flow. I've got three slow speed operators, right? One is just to slow it down before frame 50 so it doesn't keep kind of jiggling around here to the links, right? Before a ball comes in and then all the balls come in and then I, uh, I slow it down at the end of all the balls so that it doesn't keep jiggling for a while. That's really what those slow operators are doing. Um, let's go ahead and actually create part of this right now. Uh, so let's go ahead and turn this into a tie flow object or a tie flow uh, animation. So we just create a tie flow icon, just place it somewhere in our scene for now that we can access, uh, go into the editor, I'll just set the edit up here. All right, we're going to birth objects and we'll rename this top loop. And that's going to be the ring at the top there. We can pick this ring and I'm going to do it separately from the other supporting uh, links because what if I want to animate the bounce differently here, right? So this is just the top loop. We're going to hit the tab key and turn it into a physics shape. And this is going to be a mesh object because it's not dynamic and it's not going to be moving and we want it to be hanging in the air, right? So the, me the hole will be exactly the shape of the mesh, right? So that's our top loop. Let's do these support links here. Birth objects, uh, that's our support links that are going to be attached to this loop. They're also going to be mesh objects. So we're going here and rename this top loop support links. And again, tab physics shape. And again, it's going to be mesh. Now the rest of it is going to be dynamic objects, right? So let's do birth objects again. And this time we want all the dynamic object, all the dynamic links, which is everything up below those, the loop and the links, right? So add selected. And you can see we've already gone up to 686 particles. So that's pretty cool. And of that, nearly uh, 670 of them are dynamic. Uh, hit the key, physics, hit the tab key, physics shape. Now, by default, it's convex hull. So all our links, let me turn off the, the net layers. Uh, convex hull is when you shrink wrap each link, is going to close the hole. So right now, by default, tie flow sees that all these links can't be hooked together. So we had, you know, what was what I call a motion explosion, you can see this whole net has totally exploded. Now, when we go in and select, because we made our links uh, with compound uh, hole design in mind with elements, once we pick the, the right hole here, our net, if everything is aligned correctly, should actually go back together. And you can see that means we did good placement on all the links uh, none of them are intersecting or uh, not lined up properly. So without doing much else, this is already the beginning of a net. If I move the time animation slider forward, you can see that it was starting to behave like 
physics animation, but as soon as the net starts to fall, everything breaks and starts to fall apart. Now that's either got to do with the um, uh, frame step or the physics sub step. So we go in here and select our tie flow, and come out here and modify panel. Now, the way that I generally work this with something that has this many components and the chance for breakage or penetration is I try to leave the frame step as low as I have to. Now we may have to adjust that as the balls come and see if they break the chain, but let's just do half a frame right now and see what happens here, right? You can already see that that was enough that the chain went back together, right? And it's not going to uh, fall apart. You can see that it's jiggling and moving a little bit, but you know, really, uh, we just go back into tie flow and add a bit of a a slow operator here. Let's do rename this to the net, and I'll put it on frame zero, and hit the tab key, and type slow, and we just do. Uh, one percent for when the ball and everything is not interacting so right now that should slow down the net a bit after about 40 something frames it should calm down right so I mean there is your dynamic uh, net so you would really play around with this slow speed operator might have to come over here and adjust the time step and depending on how you feel about your animation we've got everything else here at default depending on how you feel about your animation you might have to increase this sub step a little bit i'm actually going to put it at 12 because i know roughly that's what i liked for this thing i don't want to have more steps and things that i need right now because recording the video is going to take a while to update but all right so now we actually kind of have a dynamic net now it is going to jiggle around at the beginning because first it falls under its own weight so when I originally set up this animation I actually started at frame 50 and uh, we go in here and we change this slow operator to say 5% that's why I had three of them the initial one to slow down the net then as the balls approached I loosened the slow down to 1% and then after all the balls are gone through the net, I went back and put it back to 5%. But you can see here how the net really settled down now, right? And now it's just a matter of setting up your uh, ball animation. All right, I intended to keep this video at 25 minutes and it's gone over, but there's nothing I can do about it. Um, all right, we're going to jump ahead a little bit. This is our final flow. And... I've shown you the important stuff of actually we, how we created the net and this whole supporting thing. The balls are fairly easy, but you know this isn't real life, and we don't have a person throwing it. So the balls. So for some re way, we're going to have to fake it or do whatever. We could have dropped them straight down, but I actually wanted to hit the back plane and then bounce around and go in the net for a bit more effect and realism. So you know. How do we fake this person shooting the balls over and hitting the back plane? Well, the easiest way I found it was I just um, made some ball guides, right? And just to show you where the balls are originally. And uh, if we go into this top view here, you can kind of see how the balls are dropping in at the top here of this uh, ramps. And they're actually going to guide them into hitting the back plane. And when we go back to tie flow, we can see here that the guided ramps, uh, they're not rendered and they're not turned on to display. So once I actually turn off the, the mesh um, objects, all right, you won't see them. The biggest thing that you had to worry about here is uh, placing the ramps in such a way that when the ball bounces off this, it doesn't come back and hit these ramps. Initially, I had where the balls would come back and hit the ramp, so I had to move the ramp. And obviously, you're going to have to um, play with where, what angle, uh, where you place these 
ramps exactly to get the effect you're looking for. I wanted a couple of balls to bounce off this ring before they went in, so I've pre-buffered um, the tie flow so that we can see the effect down here, right? In the bottom viewport, you can see how they come in, bounce, and the reason I have four different balls is I wanted to release them at specific times, right? So that's why you see frame 65, frame 120, 160 and 220 and if I um, turn off uh, the guides and the original mesh balls you can see how that kind of looks when they come in it looks as if they're being thrown right you could also maybe try to do this with some sort of uh, tie icon and shot them out of that but I just found this easier to set up and if we turn the stand on for effect you know, this is kind of how it looks in the camera view down the bottom here. Now as far as final tie flow settings go concerned over here, um, the main things that you end up playing around for this kind of um, animation is the time step. Um, I try to leave this time step as low as possible in, to try and prevent jitter. And then you go down here and you play around with um, the substeps. So you can see here I ended up at 12 for my substeps. I ended up at a quarter frame for my time step. And of course throughout this whole animation, you, how much do you want these balls to bounce? How much do they bounce off the ring? How much do they end up bouncing off the ball? How much do they bounce off the back plane? So, you know, the only settings that you're really playing with in tie flow is this restitution, which equals bounce, and maybe friction if you feel you need to adjust that. And when we come over here for the net, I mentioned earlier that I used the slow operator, right? The slow here is actually, uh, let me go over here, you can see 10% at the beginning until the net slows down. Then once the balls come down, I decrease it to 1%, and then once all the balls are gone through the net, I put it back at 6% uh, just so the net has a nice slowdown effect after all the balls have gone through. And, you know, that's pretty well, with good hole design and good model practice as far as trying to make this kind of thing for tie flow, that's really all it takes to make a basketball and uh, net kind of animation that's fully driven by PhysX. Uh, before we go for this tutorial, uh, we'll just uh, summarize. One of the things I should also have said was when we were moving all these links around here and placing them, before we add them to tie flow, personally I think it's good to ungroup everything. So um, you can try it either way, but I prefer to ungroup all my groups before I add them to tie flow. And the ball size. Well, I kind of made it almost the same size as this bottom loop here. I just kept playing around with the size until I found the one that got the best uh, interaction with the net. I mean, at some point, maybe you could start trying, you know, soft body stuff if you want more bouncing around. But, you know, these are chains, so I like the way it was interacting. And as far as, you know, settings that I changed over here, most of them had to do with uh, restitution, which is bounce. All right, so I just adjusted restitution depending on what I wanted, the ball against the floor, which we saw when I pointed out the main settings, the ball against the backboard, you know, friction against the chain. That's really as simple as it gets as far as making the adjustments. I think that's where we're going to leave it for this one. The next one I'm going to do will be uh, the bicycle chain with the sprocket gears. Uh, take it easy, everybody. Have a good one.